Welcome. Um, I'm Marie Harvey, Associate Dean for Research, and I'm delighted to welcome you to the uh, first seminar for our research seminar spring term and the um, alumni lecture, which is part of the uh, visiting student, graduate student day that's happening today. So this is a, a seminar uh, with both of those events. And um, it's been really fun to get to, <clears throat> to meet the students today. And there's some of you on Zoom, so welcome. And there's also uh, participants just here to listen to the seminar on Zoom. So welcome to the Zoom crowd. We have a great crowd in, in uh, here, which is fun, but it's just more and more, I, more people are coming in person and I love to see that. So um, I would like to introduce David Cortez. He is the Director of Recruitment and Admissions here for the college. He has uh, been very instrumental in orchestrating today and is, going to be introducing our speaker and moderating this session. So David, take it away. Thank you, Marie. Hello, everyone. Uh, my name is David Cortez. Um, I'll be introducing Dr. Warren, um, who has been gracious enough to come up to present in person. Um, so thank you all for being here in person as well as virtual. Uh, like was mentioned, actually today is a combination and a mix of uh, different individuals in the audience, both current students uh, prospective students who will be making decisions of whether they'd like to come or not, um, as well as uh, faculty, staff, and other folks um, across the virtual world. Um, so Dr. Warren um, is a public health administrator for Lane County, uh, also the chair of coalition of local health officials and a member of the Oregon Public Health Advisory Board. Along with all of that, she is actually an alum of Oregon State as well, who received both her MPH and her PhD. So if you would all uh, join me in welcoming uh, Dr. Warren uh, with a round of applause. Thank you. Thank you very much. I have notes today because it's been um, a long time since I've done a presentation. <laughs> so thank you for bearing with me. Kind of far away from that. Let's see. Does that work okay? Testing, does that sound okay? Yes, okay, thank you. Well, thank you very much for being here today. I am really glad to join you. Um, as I'm Jocelyn Warren, I'm the health administrator for Lane County. I've been in that role for a little over eight years. Um, I came from Oregon State, so I did not have a background in public health practice, and it was um, a very steep learning curve. There was a lot to know, um, but I came at a time, I joined public health practice at a time um, when we were going through healthcare transformation are just beginning that journey at the state level. Um, so we were standing up coordinated care organizations and the Public Health Advisory Board. <laughs> and all of these uh, all of these things to transform what health would look like in the state of Oregon. And it, it's a very exciting time. There was a lot of hope, a lot of potential for us. You want to go to the next slide, please? There was a a grand vision. And that's what the nice thing about um, this grand vision is it was public health is really central to the vision. Um, it started with community care organizations, but quickly moved, I think, to um, the central role of public health because you need a strong public health system in order to have a really efficient and effective um, healthcare system to achieve the triple aim of better health at lower cost um, and better care. Next slide, please. And um, how many people here are familiar with public health modernization? Oh, good. It, it animates everything we do at the local level. Um, and it's, it is an exciting thing because it's not just Oregon that's doing this. This is a national model that's been adopted or adapted for Oregon to include, which I think is really important, is 
specifically for Oregon is health equity and cultural responsiveness. So that piece is really key. This national model is one that's being adopted in states throughout the country. Um, Washington is on this journey as well. They're probably our closest in terms of where we are in um, implementation. There's also Ohio, Kentucky, um, and then there are a number of other states that are joining. They're all supported in this work too about bringing public health into the 21st century by the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation is um, convening a lot of us through the Public Health National Center for Innovation, which is actually connected with the other fab, which is the Public Health Accreditation Board. There's a lot of acronyms. Of course, we're public health. We love acronyms, don't we? <laughs> but this is what I love about, um, about our model is that health equity is called out specifically. And the difference um, between the capabilities and the programs, the programs are what public health is always done and the, pro, the way we deliver our services, communicable disease and environmental health, access to clinical preventive services um, and uh, health promotion and health prevention, of course. And, but what, but what this model recognizes is we have a lot of skills and capabilities that are necessary to effectively deliver those programs and calling those out specifically ensures that they get the attention and the funding that we need in order to be able to implement these programs. So there are communications, policy and planning, assessment and epidemiology, community partnership development is especially connected with health equity and leadership and organizational competencies. It sounds very boring, but it's not boring. It's quality improvement. Like that's where um, the magic happens for us in public health. Okay, next slide, please. So the, um, how we implement um, our modernization model. Um, one of the things that's really key to this model is that there's flexibility at the local level. One of the things that has, I think, bedeviled public, public health at the local level for a long time is um, siloed funding. We get this money for tobacco prevention and this money for suicide prevention and this money to do uh, disease control. And that doesn't allow a lot of efficiencies in terms of staffing. Um, there are a lot of very specific deliverables that may or may not be things that are really important in your community, um, but you don't have any say about what that looks like in a community. You have to follow, of course, the where the funding comes from. So with modernization, uh, we don't have that. We have a much more flexible funding streams, but what we do need to do is figure out how do we create the capacity in those capabilities, those things like communication and policy and planning. Things that a lot of, I think, MPH students actually have a lot of skills in. And that's, that's really important because that was key to our idea about creating what we call a public health learning lab. And the idea behind that is to bring together the staff we have that do have some of those skills and they usually tend to be our MPH um, folks uh, that are usually sitting in our prevention section because they're doing policy and planning kind of at that higher level. Um, bring those folks together with people in our staff that may not have a public health background but are very interested in this topic. They wanna know more about how to achieve health equity. They wanna know more about policy and planning or how to do, especially now epidemiology is very compelling for um, a large number of people in public health and everywhere. We get lots of email about how we should be doing epidemiology. So that's fun. <laughs> so <laughs> our original um, plan, and this dates back to pre-pandemic um, and kind of earlier on, it was we were going to have this idea where we would bring together the, these, these staff and instead of committees, we're moving to this learning lab plan where we would have a committee develop a work plan that actually took some part of public health modernization to implement that manual you saw earlier and includes all the deliverables that we need to do um, for, it's really a roadmap to how to achieve uh, modernization at the local and the state level. So they would take some piece of that manual and say, this is what we're gonna implement this year. And what kind of training or skill building do we need in order to be able to realize that? And so we've given them a small budget, you know, two grand annually, not a lot, but let, allow them anyway to start thinking about how they want to allocate that for their group um, to achieve, you know, their annual goals. And that was originally planned for September, 2019 through January 21 to launch. And we started with the health equity lab because we already had a health equity committee and they were um, very vocal, very robust, you know, very involved. And they were like, that's perfect. This is the perfect group. We will, uh, and they can also recruit others um, to their cause. So that was going to be great. 
we had trouble necessarily. I was trying to generate enthusiasm for the other labs among my staff. And what I would keep hearing was, we don't have time for that. You know, like, like our WIC certifiers, for example, are scheduled back to back all day. You know, they can't take time out to do this work and then our other work just is laid on top of it. So that was something we had to think about is how do we create the time and the um, capacity for staff to be able to participate in this so we can make it a requirement because I, when I came from OSU, you know, part of our work was that we had to devote and I believe it was 10% of our time to service. Some, it's some percentage of time. And I thought like, well, that's a great model. We need to have that um, in local public health. Some amount of percentage of your time should be devoted to organizational health and how you're kind of contributing to our overall mission um, of modernization. Next slide, please. But then, <laughs> I don't know if uh, you remember that back to March, 2020. <laughs> uh, I'm still a little um, speechless. I'm not really sure what happened. Uh, the first, uh, the first case um, in the U.S. was in Seattle on January 20th, and then um, the first case in Lane County was on March 4th. All right, I should say our confirmed first confirmed case because nobody really knows still yet, like when cases actually started and circulating um, in the U.S. Next slide. This is actually what the world looked like. Um, the day that our first case uh, was confirmed, there's a lot of big red dots. It happened very fast, or at least it seemed very fast at the time. It Actually, looking back now at our epi curve, and I'll show that in a little bit, it was a, a pretty slow workup, but we just, you know, if you don't know what's coming, you have no way of knowing kind of where you are um, along the way. And of course, none of us had ever been in a pandemic before, but we did have a pandemic plan um, because we're public health and we have emergency preparedness as one of our foundational capabilities. And um, I mean, we got out our plan and the first thing we did was call Red Cross, because they have what's called ESF-6 mass care. And our first problem was the unhoused, is we had um, a number of people needing shelter. All, the, um, all of the shelter serving organizations were shut down. A lot of them depend on volunteers. A lot of those volunteers were older and they were staying home. So it came to public health, which was a surprise to us because we're like, we're, we, don't do, um, we don't do homeless services. We don't know anything about that, but there wasn't anybody else around. So because we're public health, we just do what needs to be done, right? So we had to jump in. That was really where we started was that. And it was, it was a huge, learning experience. Also, it also, we were also acutely aware of how ridiculous it was to be standing up congregate sheltering uh, during a pandemic, when the last thing you want to do is put a bunch of people together in the same room, right? That's not very smart. But the alternative of having no shelter was much worse. And we spent a lot of time trying to get cooperation from hotels um, and other folks like that. And um, that was very complicated and not very successful. Next slide, please. So this is my, if you want to play, if you, I think if you, this is what it felt like, honestly, um, <laughs> being in the middle of a pandemic. And I will say that was true up until just a few weeks ago. Um, the problem with, it's not a problem, but the, it is a problem, is that you're always in hyper response mode um, during a pandemic or during any emergency response, but emergency responses are developed <laughs> or our plans for them are developed to be local for one thing. There's an assumption that you're gonna be able to draw resources from outside the emergency area. Um, but when the emergency covers the whole globe, there is no other place to go for those resources. And it's also, the assumption is going to be that it's going to be somewhat limited. It's not gonna go on and on and on <laughs> and on. And so there were a lot of things that we learned in that because of mostly staffing is, um, is really problematic. We thought, we had a pretty deep bench uh, in incident command. Um, is anybody familiar here with incident command? I'm trained in that? Do you have a trained role in incident command? Can I get your name? No. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, so we um, took the doctor at the, so we have 
<laughs> You're like, leave me out of this. I'm not part of your disaster. <laughs> oh, fantastic. That should be, and it is a prerequisite for joining local public health. Um, and then there's specialized training for the chief roles, right? For logistics and planning, operations, incident commander. I am now the incident commander of our response. I know that gives you great comfort. <laughs> well, we've had two other incident commanders. I'm the incident commander now, and which is a good sign, is that our response is contracting somewhat. And we're able to manage it now within our health department, at least for the time being. As you exceed the resources that are available in your health department, um, you go up to the next level. In our case, the next level is health and human services department. And then we exceeded that the next week um, and we were going up to the county. So by the time that we got to the county level, then we can bring in um, the emergency operations manager and all the other people from public works. Anybody who's got any training was there. And a lot of people who have that training are emergency responders. We have people on fire and um, a lot of fire response, partly because we have wildfires is one of our most common emergencies. So that's where a lot of people come from. Also, the whole incident command system, which is a very, you know, um, regular, you know, regulated, um, very specific, lots of specific trainings. Um, it's by the book. There's a form for everything. This came out of wildland firefighting. So that's the model that it's built on. And no wildland fire goes on for two years. You know, so there's there, there are some limits, I think, to the incident command application for a pandemic. And those are things that we're looking at now too, to how do we take perhaps a slightly different approach um, next time. <laughs> there will be a next time, or maybe even in the fall. We don't know what's gonna happen. Next slide. So it's no wonder that we felt like we were being buffeted by giant waves. Um, it, I mean, and, and then we had a slow, it, it didn't feel this way down here, I will tell you. Anytime we got a new case, um, it was, um, there was a lot of anxiety <laughs> and a lot of fear, you know, and a lot of not exactly sure uh, how to we knew how to respond, and we have a lot of very great professionals and a lot of nurses that know how to do this work extremely well. But not knowing what's coming next is um, is a really difficult place to, to sit inside for a long time. For a long time, we were keeping the names of our cases on a board in our communicable disease supervisor's office. It's locked and HIPAA proof, I promise. But um, we knew we knew who the people were. We knew their stories too. But you know, we started to get up here, and you lose sight of that. You can't keep track of hundreds of cases. We ran out of boards. We started putting up extra boards and then there were no more boards left. So we went to spreadsheets and our um, state data system, which sometimes has some limitations. So we still back up everything in Excel. Um, but we come up here and this is where, you know, it really got, it gets really difficult. And Delta was probably the worst. Omicron looks far worse. Definitely, but because the um, the severity of disease was not as high, it was not nearly as complicated to respond to as, as the Delta variant. And what we're always looking at, of course, because our goal is to reduce deaths. We want to avoid deaths. You know, we we started when we kind of began thinking about it was kind of reducing transmission, but that's not really it. You reduce transmission because you want to reduce deaths. That, that piece we always had in our um, emergency operations center, like how do we limit deaths? And, um, and so that's what we're doing here is really focused because Delta was far more severe than Omicron, but we didn't have um, as severe disease and there weren't as many deaths, which sounds ridiculous to say now, like to say as many deaths as if, um, you know, that's sort of normal. I don't know if anybody saw that article in the Atlantic about how we're approaching a million deaths from COVID and how did that become something normal or something people kind of live with and expect. Um, we have just passed 500 in Lane County, you know, which is an extraordinary number and not anything that we would have um, anticipated at the beginning of the pandemic. It's been a rough two years. <laughs> okay, the next next slide. So I want to here to talk about equity. And I think the most important thing about the pandemic um, and the Black Lives Matter movement, and it was important that those two things occurred um, 
roughly at the same time. Um, but that one of the you know things we really learned, and I you know, we keep saying it, and some people still don't want to believe it, but we're all connected, you know, and you cannot live in a bubble. Um, and the pandemic certainly highlighted that in ways that um, we could never kind of do theoretically uh, for other people. And um, I love Martin Luther King's description of the inescapable web of mutuality. So that that is that underlies everything in public health too, I think, right? I mean, it's not just pandemics, but we think about peer influences and um, clean water. And I mean, there's just all, all of the things of the social um, influences around us are so important. So there's there's that piece, but then there's there are viruses, <laughs> you know, and, and communicable disease means that somebody gave it to you, you know, and when somebody dies, it's because somebody gave them that disease. And it's that piece, it can be really heartbreaking and it's really important to understand and recognize, especially when people were, we had, of course, many people resisting um, wearing masks and they would come to our uh, commissioner's meetings every month to, to, to rail against mask wearing, which seemed like such a small thing for, for what it can accomplish um, in a pandemic. But other, you know, it, not everybody believes this. Not everybody wants to believe that they're connected to other people. But we saw that very, very strongly. The other thing, though, that was really clear is that even though everybody is involved, not everybody suffers in the same way or doesn't affect everyone in the same way. And we certainly had people that were much more vulnerable to poor outcomes because of the position they already occupied in society. So that was very clear and something that we, um, we really tried to focus on very early in the pandemic starting with um, the unhoused, but moving quickly to communities of color as well. So yeah, sorry, I'm thinking, I think next slide. Thank you. So there were a lot we did to respond um, to, to try to achieve health equity um, that were more of an urgent matter. We were lucky to already have the, the health equity lab kind of already engaged and very much wanting to be involved in the incident command and um, providing their uh, kind of equity lens and recommendations around um, where we were doing testing or outreach or vaccinations. So we took a lot of their um, recommendations as well. One of those was to include um, an equity officer in the, I, in the incident command structure. That is not something that is part of the traditional incident command structure, um, but it is such a great asset to have somebody there that that's their only job. They're only filtering every, every, every action, every decision for the implications for health equity. So that that piece was really great. Um, we are, and we were that was that report came from um, a group called uh, the Bay Area Regional Inequalities Initiative, which is. I thought it was bar high, but somebody told me it's bar he. So it feels a little bit like nacho and nacho. I'm not sure. It's definitely nacho or nacho. Don't say nacho. Um, <laughs> but uh, but bar high, bar he. I'm not sure. But they're a great resource for equity. Um, we used a lot of their work to do um, in, uh, initial community assessments around how we were doing in the community around health equity. This is before the pandemic hit, and among our staff, what they thought, how they thought we were doing in health equity. And the answer was like. Like really, really poorly. Um, we uh, it was <laughs> not good, not good. And our uh, our epidemiologist, who is um, the community health epidemiologist, she wanted to have a report card to be able to report back. And it was all D's and F's. And <laughs> like I I understand it's important to communicate this information, and it's absolutely I'm not trying to sugarcoat this, but this is not going to inspire people. We need to think about another way to present the same information. Is there a color coding or something we can do? So we're working on that piece. Um, and it actually gave us a lot of good, um, a, a, lot of, a lot of food for thought in the pandemic as well. A lot of areas that we could really concentrate on, which were really important. So a couple of the things we did besides um, taking the recommendations of the Health Equity Lab was we created a new program called the Community Partnerships Program. And this is also drawn from the modernization manual. Uh, community partnerships is one of our um, one of our primary capabilities. And it's really it's really integral for achieving health equity because it's working with community based organizations and other stakeholders and communities, making sure there's a feedback loop for that information. 
So that was, um, that's been great. We got um, funding. I don't know if, if this has happened at the university, but once COVID hit and everybody and the funding started coming, then it just, it was an, another wave of funding, which is um, difficult, actually, very difficult for local public health to absorb. And then because you also can't carry things necessarily forward, they have to be expended by a certain date. So it's just one time funding, which does nothing for public health because public health is people powered. We need people and we need staff. And if we can't, promise staff that they're going to have a job in a year they're not always willing to stay and there's you know we want to be able to invest in their skill development and keep them and have them you know move up in the organization and share their expertise but um we can't do that with one-time funding and we have very you know limiting rules in the county about how you can use one-time funding so i couldn't hire staff if i if i wanted to i got around it some ways with some things but um we had other sources of um funding though that we were able to hire immediately the folks for for the community partnerships program we have three fte we have a, a supervisor um, a community outreach coordinator and uh, an epidemiologist and that piece is really exciting because we have really terrible data around our smaller communities. There are very small ends and a lot of you know, the large data sets. So are very limited on what we can say about smaller groups in our county, especially within particular zip codes or anything like that. So it is going to be this person's job to figure out how to um, work with communities in order to be able to kind of create those strategies for collecting the data that's meaningful to the communities and that they feel really represents them bringing that back to the health department as well so that we can also try to look at that in the bigger picture and think what kind of programs that we need to develop, taking it back to the community again so that there's this feedback loop for the work that we're doing together. But it has to be based on data. That's always our first, our first stop. And in this case, the data are not great, sometimes really bad. And so the, the goal really is to decolonize those data. And then we are also, we had additional, um, another kind of, you know, kind of a lot of funding from the Oregon Health Authority around equity to um, to advance the vaccine initiatives and really um, really bring up vaccination rates among um, communities of color. So we hired a number of bilingual bicultural vaccinators. Um, we had added incentives. Obviously, these are not, I mean, a lot of people use these strategies. These are not unique at all to um, Lane County. We hosted clinics with our community-based organizations. And since we had a ton of money, we could bring in food trucks and swag and um, music. And then we also have some great groups that also um, go to do in-home vaccination or wherever. You know, you can make a request for vaccination anywhere in Lane County, and they will be able to um, accommodate that request. So those things are things that we just did in the moment. We're like, what do we need to do? Let's do it fast, throw it out there. And it's not the way we like to roll in public health. We're very planful people. We like to review the data, look at all of our alternatives. What does the evidence say? Read some journal articles, but we didn't have time for that. So we moved very quickly. Now, it feels like we are just starting to be able to get a chance to breathe and pause and think about how do we do this more intentionally? Um, because this work is so important and there is a great risk too in getting it wrong. So we don't want to, um, we're gonna make mistakes and we know that and that's, that's the nature of the work and we have to own those and then um, just work to do better next time and keep learning. So that commitment to learning is really important as an organization as well. So the, um, the Community Ship Partnerships Program has developed a CBO network. This is a group of CBOs that were initially convened around vaccination or doing outreach in communities. And um, they are continuing to meet and, and starting to pivot to thinking about what, what else what else can we do now with these great new partnerships that we have? Um, what are their priority health concerns? And part of that is the data loop as well. So we'll be working with them specifically on how to do um, more data collection, identify the priorities of concern within particular communities. And then ideally, and this is just still aspirational, but connect that to our community health improvement plan. It would be great to have one kind of framework for all of the health improvement plan or health improvement work done in the county. And we've put a lot of time and effort into our uh, community health improvement plan. So that would be a great way to structure that if 
that works out. Um, our Board of Health declared racism a public health crisis last May, um, and that was a great step. It was a great first step in um, acknowledging the effects of racism on health outcomes in Lane County specifically and acknowledging some of the history of Lane County. There is also um, a really terrific uh, a timeline, um, it's called a BIPOC timeline that the um, supervisor for our community partnerships program put together. She used to be the equity coordinator for the county. So she's had, a, she's been working in this area for a long time, which is really great for us because she is terrific and knows what she's doing. Um, and, but the, the timeline is also an acknowledgement of a lot of the events that have led to really poor health outcomes among, among some groups in our county. And so it, it really talks about, brings attention to the context and not individual behavior, which is sometimes the problem with data is that they're very individualistic and don't give you a sense of the context and the things that gave rise um, to those issues. So there, that's good. Also working on how do we retain our non-white staff that we've added that are, um, they bring so much to public health too, but it's so important also to be really thoughtful about the environment and how do you create a welcoming environment and um, what are the supports um, that people need that are most effective for them in the workplace. I think that's been, um, that's been really cool. Part of it's creating career paths too, which is sometimes challenging in a county system because it's also a very hierarchical um, organization and there's not some always places to go. So we also talk about leadership too and what does leadership look like in different positions throughout the county structure. Um, but the coolest thing um, is our mobile outreach. So because we had all this one-time funding, we were able to purchase a um, mobile clinic um, and then like tucked it away at Public Works for a few months because we didn't have the time to do anything with it and had to spend the money by the end of the year. But it's a really, um, it's a great piece of equipment. We outfitted it to, to our highest need, which is STI testing and treatment in our county, which is absolutely um, the thing that is going to be the, take the most concerted effort um, after COVID. That's, um, and it's, it's gotten um, even much worse um, during the pandemic because um, services and access were even further restricted. So syphilis particularly is something that we'll be paying a much closer attention to. We had at least five or eight. It depends on how you define. Um, so this is a little <laughs> interesting. We had five cases of congenital syphilis in which the mother was also diagnosed with syphilis. We had three cases of congenital syphilis in which the mother had not been diagnosed. So those three technically don't count even. I, I don't know how they would have gotten syphilis if the mother hadn't been positive, but I guess there's no assumption of syphilis. Anyway, that's a little just aside. Um, but, they, but the mobile clinic thing is, I think is really exciting. It is one of the strategies that was proposed at the state level when the state passed the racism as a public health crisis resolution that was largely, I think, supported by Leslie Gregory, who, whose organization, Right to Health, um, really promotes mobile um, services as a way to bring those services to the communities and really kind of close gaps and access and uh, ensure that um, folks in the community have the same access to information and services and, and that it's culturally appropriate as well. And um, she's fantastic and hope, we're hoping to be able to collaborate with her too on um, our mobile outreach plans. <laughs> Next slide, please, thanks. The nice thing also is that as we're trying to figure out equity, like we're not doing this in a vacuum, obviously. There are many um, initiatives um, that, that in this, and a lot of effort are in public health around achieving um, health equity. The state's goal for the Oregon Health Authority, for the, um, for the state of Oregon, um, Healthier Together, is elimination of health disparities, health inequities by 2030 which is very ambitious. So um, we hope to contribute to that. Um, you may have seen that the 10 essential public health services were updated to um, put equity at the center. Um, I don't know amongst a group of researchers how that feels. I think research was bumped, was it not? Was not research, I think research used to be in the middle of the circle. <laughs> Um, it's still there, obviously. <laughs> we, don't, we don't get to evidence-based uh, services without research. Um, but, the, but putting equity at the center really highlights that this has to be um, the goal of public health um, at all levels in all places. Next slide, please. 
So now that we have a little um, breathing space and thinking about, okay, let's get back to planning. You know, we're, we'll get back to the public health work that we're so used to doing. We, we are so very aware now of all of the disparities in our community and where the health inequities are specifically. We have great partnerships, people to work with to help us in those areas and for and for, for us to help them. You know, this is um, definitely a place where sometimes we lead, but sometimes we are allies or just supporting or doing um, whatever the, the community needs in that moment to achieve their health priorities. So that's exciting. Um, we also have Right now, at least, we have funding. We have, <laughs> you know, we seem to have the support um, definitely at the state, also right now at the federal level. Um, certainly from our Board of County Commissioners in Lane County um, are very strong supporters of the work. We have public visibility. I mean, obviously, you know, public health has been um, out there in a way that uh, it never was before. That was always our conversation was like, how do we make it so people know what public health does? You know, and it's like, well, they know it. They know a little bit now anyway. <laughs> they know the piece about uh, pandemic response. Um, so it's exciting. We want there's a lot that there's a lot of opportunity. And uh, I think the temptation is to like jump in and like, OK, what's the next thing? What are we going to do now? Like, let's let's go. We're going to make our plan. Um, and we have an amazing, amazing staff. But because we have an amazing staff, what we really need the next is just slow down. <laughs> Everybody needs a break um, and a deep breath. And I'm sure all of you are feeling the same way. Like it has been, um, it has been a really nutty last few years. It's been extremely difficult for everyone. It's been really hard on my staff. It's been um, hard on the whole community. People have lost family members. People are suffering from um, long-term COVID um, in, their, in their life. And everybody has had some kind of loss. You know, we've had loss of social connections, people with children in school. I am I'm especially, um, you know, worried about, I mean, the long-term effects of COVID and, and on schools and kids, we don't know yet, and we won't know um, for a while. So, I mean, there are still a lot of things we don't know. We, for sure, don't know what's going to happen with COVID, um, and we are certainly monitoring national and international um, data, looking at different trends. It doesn't look like anything is out there worrisome right now, but that can change at any minute, as we all know now. We all know that we don't know. <laughs> and that's that's a hard place to be. And we're learning too that it's so important to do um, self-care. Like people have to take care of themselves and we have to do everything we can um, to support the wellness of our staff because it's, you know, it's going to be long term. We thought it was going to be a sprint. It was no sprint. <laughs> you know, we jumped in with both feet and started, you know, as hard as we could. And that was that was a mistake. We burned some people out for sure. Not everybody could keep up with that. And we lost people. So it's it is so important to um, to really be um, cognizant and aware of how important this piece is. So in addition to an equity officer, I think we also need a wellness officer too, like somebody that is watching for that across a response that's going to be really long. Because if you don't have the staff to do the work, you know, that you're you're doomed. And we just we need to be able to to keep good people um, with us. So it's hard because I know personally, I love thinking about the future and planning and there's all this opportunity and I want to start jumping in and planning. And then I hear from my staff, they're just like, <laughs> you need to stop. <laughs> just like go slow, go slow. You know, there's, there's, there's lots of time, you know, really, we need to just take a long view um, in public health. We've always done that. We know that we're, you know, we're really in it for the long game. So we're, Trying to do that at Lane County. We are trying to do that with our state partners as well. We have some of the same issues between local and state partners that we've done a lot of things um, you know, hurriedly and in the moment. And it may not have been necessarily the best thing for us, for our relationships as a system. But now it's time for us to just pause um, and think about that some more and really plan together and, um, and, and think about how to strengthen our relationships. 
And because we're not the same too, like we're not, we are completely, our health department is very different. Um, we have, we started with 80 staff going in and now we have about 130, um, which means of course we don't have a lot of space. That's a problem. Luckily people are teleworking. We never teleworked before. That was unheard of, you know? So that's exciting because we've wanted to do that for a long time to increase, you know, staff satisfaction. That's a really great one. So that's cool. There's, but there's, you know, we just, we have to be really thoughtful about where we're at now because it's, we're not ever going back. This is completely different. This is a new world. Okay, next slide. And I was thinking about this a lot because the last time I did a presentation or last time I was in a conference was here in 2019. Um, and uh, it was amazing. And if you didn't see the keynote address from Jolene Joseph, who is the it's called the Native Wellness Institute. Um, she's the director, the executive director. It's on the o um, Oregon Public Health Association website. Um, it was an extraordinary um, presentation. So I, I encourage you um, to review that if you hadn't seen it. Um, was anybody, did anybody see that? Yeah, it was, oh, it was, it was incredibly impactful. I, I still, it, I think about it all the time. Um, she talked a lot about our connections to each other, you know, and I think that, um, um, and her perspective was, you know, was, was uniquely indigenous in a lot of ways, which um, brought a lot to that perspective. But I also like that the connection wasn't just about connection between us in space, but across time as well. And, and that's why health equity is so important because those harms and those, um, those the, the damage done um, in previous generations is still with us. We're still connected, you know, so that is really important to, um, to understand um, before you can kind of move forward with trying to make things better. Those, those, we, we feel that it's still reverberating. Um, one thing she said though, that if we, um, we can change and if we do change, then next slide. Shift happens. Um, that was her. <laughs> she was like shift happens, and I I think when she was saying it sounds shift sounds very kind of slow and you know think kind of um, and then the pandemic hit and I think the shift has happened a lot more quickly than um, than we would have anticipated, which is really nice. Um, it, it gives us a lot more momentum for doing this work, um, and we know that health inequities are not just a byproduct of unjust policies, but we're in many cases is the deliberate construction of policies. So that is something that we continue to learn about and we need to change. And it's been a long time in coming and we want to do better. And now we have the opportunity and hopefully all the tools, um, which is also something Julian Joseph um, left us with as well after that conference. And that's, that's all I have. So I'm happy to take any questions. <laughs> Thank you for being so patient. It really is weird to do a presentation after <laughs> nothing like that for years. It's just, it's, it's nutty. Anybody, any, does any, was anybody involved in any of the um, local response here in Benton County or in your home counties? Yeah. Oh, nice. Yeah, that's great. That was really cool. That's a great project. So, you know, that kind of, that's the kind of thing too, like the innovation that, you know, may not have happened had it not been for such an, you know, an enormous need so quickly. Uh, SDI testing at the HIV Alliance down in Eugene. I'm one of their uh, testing technicians and counselors. Oh, thank you. HIV Alliance is one of our best partners. Absolutely. And I'm sure I'll be seeing a lot more of you than in the, <laughs> in the years to come as we really focus on STIs. Thank you for that. Cool. Do you have a question? No, I was also involved in this one. I um, was a medical assistant for helping vaccinate women's health. Um, some employees in uh, nice. and our women's space and um, the YMCA staff. Fantastic. Cool. It's great. It's so. It's so. It's it's a. Uh, it's been really interesting and lovely and a. Um, you know, heartwarming experience to see all the people that um, have come together to help us kind of move through the pandemic. We had um, over 500 volunteers that helped with our mass vaccination clinics and yes, amazing people. And our goal is to keep them too. We didn't have what's called a um, medical reserve corps going into the pandemic. Um, other large counties do. We felt that 
loss very acutely. We had to go, just because it meant a lot more paperwork, you have to go through the state for a server. Um, but now we've got we've got those people on already in our system. They are with us and um, volunteers for us. And we're developing something called our Public Health Reserve Corps that um, is medical, but also other um, other talents and other expertise that we can deploy to communities that are in need of other services, you know, either um, kind of acute needs or just something we've identified over time working with our community partners that we might need. So we'll be using volunteers a lot more. Yep. Anything else? With your mobile clinic, are you picturing like, I don't know if SDI like, there's a lot like in other cities, but in within Lamplin County, or like more. well. Definitely around Lane County. I mean, one of the things we hear from Lane County is huge. It's the size of Connecticut, you know. So though that's that's a real challenge for us. It's the only large county that's actually large geographically, and we hear all the time from um, folks in Florence or Oak Ridge, uh, Cottage Grove that public health isn't there. And it's not exactly true because we monitor disease everywhere. We WIC is everywhere. We do um, nurse home visiting everywhere. Environmental health is everywhere. But you know, point well taken. It is it's different to have your services located in an area, to have a building, to be there in person. So our goal is to take and actually, could you flip back through to where the photos are? Um, no, I keep yeah, the, the one before this. This is our unit. So it doesn't look like this yet. Um, but it will, it's being wrapped. Uh, this is the unit and it's, uh, so it's very friendly. Um, we did have um, uh, a, it was a, a campaign several years ago um, to bring attention to syphilis. I don't remember if you remember that syphilware campaign. Um, we wrapped a bunch of buses um, and it was talking about like Lane County known for vineyards and microbrews and syphilis and <laughs> did not go down well with our leadership. <laughs> so we were not, that. we learned from that. We learned from that, that I'll always make sure everybody up and down knows what's coming. Um, but uh, but this one I think is uh, it has universal approval, so that's good. It's very friendly. We even have a breastfeeding mom, which was very important to our WIC supervisor, so that's cool. Um, yeah, but we want we want to park that all over the place, so people are like oh public health. I made sure that public health is you know really big letters everywhere. <laughs> Here's public health. We are here. So yeah, that's uh, that's one of the goals is being out in the community more because yeah we are we are really in you know downtown Eugene and that's where the population is but that is not where our health inequities are necessarily and we used to I think as a as a health department be about the greatest good for the greatest number of people and that kind of works okay with vaccination because every shot in an arm benefits the whole community. But as a rule, I think if we um, coordinate our and organize our services that way, it's always <laughs> the same large group of people that end up the ones that are benefiting from those decisions. So our goal is no longer the greatest good for the most people. And, and it's, it's a big shift for us in public health moving away from that because that's population health. Um, but we need to focus on health inequities. That is going to be our metric and our guide. And if we can make changes there, then we know we're successful. Uh, do you guys have any plans to like uh, in the future purchase another one of these mobile clinics or uh, like expand the mobile clinic uh, capacity that you have? Well, we are collaborating with a number of other people that are doing mobile clinics. So like the community health centers. Um, is HIV Alliance doing anything in the mobile we space? Have, I believe a mobile like van that uh, goes out uh, and does needle exchanges and stuff. Mm -hmm. uh, and they have a couple volunteers that pop on to do uh, SDI testing. I usually visit in the office. Uh, <laughs> so I just, uh, sit there working mm -hmm. with them. But I do know we have at least one van here. Well, and I think that there's a number of other organizations too that are adding kind of mobile services to their portfolio and a lot more that are focused on doing actual primary care out in, uh, out in communities in mobile health. I wanted to make sure that uh, initially we had mobile health services in this piece and I want to make sure people knew that we weren't doing, we're not doing primary care, we're not primary care providers. You know, our public health services are very specific, um, but we will support connection to primary care, if that is super important, we wanna do that all the time. And we are working closely with the community health centers that have 
they're also standing up mobile health services. So we need to coordinate to make sure that we're not all kind of showing up the same time at the same place. Or if we do, it was deliberate, <laughs> you know, and we're trying to support each other. We have a couple of other vehicles as well that were donated during the pandemic from RideSource that are not clinics, but they, same thing, we're gonna wrap them and get them out in the community. And so we can do WIC and we can do a lot of other kind of outreach and education or um, just community meetings um, with those vehicles too, but they don't have have the same, all of the same, you know, the internal clinic capacity that we have in that vehicle that's got, you know, it's got everything. It's amazing. It's exciting. It's not on the road yet. In fact, there was a small um, fender bender, even in the public works lot. <laughs> it is hard to drive. It's very long. <laughs> it wasn't me. <laughs> Any other questions? Yes, Marie. So to current students who are participating and to those who may be joining us in the fall, these are all graduate students. Uh, what advice do you give them? Uh, I yeah, um, that's interesting because I didn't really have a good understanding of what kind of public health practice looked like until I was actually um, doing it. I do think knowing about modernization is really key anywhere and everywhere. This is how we're going to achieve our goals in the state. Um, and um, training an incident command is <laughs> is easy. It's online, and it can really make a difference for jumping in in an emergency. I it sounds. I'm not, I'm not, I'm serious. You really need to be trained in incident command. It makes a difference. You can just jump in um, and then, you know, in the moment be helpful in an emergency. There will be more emergencies, you know, and we're, so we know those are coming. Um, one of the things I think is really interesting, you know, just thinking about, I would, I, interested to see where students take more kind of research on um, what we need to do now in this environment. Like, you know, ventilation is, you know, something that's gonna, seems like it should change dramatically. Like that we cannot open a window in here. You know, doesn't that seem like not a great idea? <laughs> we can't open any windows in my offices, you know, and, I'm, and I, I feel that like we need fresh air. Um, and I don't know, if, are you familiar with the steam uh, radiator story? That steam radiators that are so hot. If you've lived on the East Coast, you know that they're burn risks, right? They're extremely hot, but they were developed during the um, the, pan flu, the pandemic of 1918, the flu pandemic, and are meant to be heating a whole room that has windows open. So which makes a lot of sense. It's about ventilation. It's keeping things warm, but you're still getting fresh air. Things like that have got to come out of this too, which is really interesting. But also I just think, you know, health equity and like thinking about being creative and thinking about how we engage with communities. We, and, and we are the community too. I mean, I think that that piece too is we don't want to, it's not us and them, you know, like this is our community. You know, how do we make sure that we have really good feedback loops in those processes and that break down that, that feeling about governmental public health. Um, there's a lot of um, antipathy towards government, especially in the West, but everywhere. Um, and if you, I, I hope that people think about what does government do for you and that you are government, like government is how we all get together and do the things that are important for our community, for our social life, the things that we've deemed are important. Public health is one of those, you know, so having a strong public health system, I think is really important. And I would encourage anybody to go into a uh, practice or to call me if you're interested um, in talking more about local public health, because I can talk about local public health endlessly as you can see. <laughs> that was just interesting on the ventilation because my brother-in-law and sister both work at the Corps of Engineers mm -hmm. and they were very involved. Um, I think nationally and locally on, yeah. Yeah, I mean, especially for schools. I mean, we have to figure out a way to, you know, be able to have kids in school and what are, what are the ways to keep it as safe as possible? Because we can't keep shutting down the schools. So if there are ways to improve ventilation, but, you know, of course that, that takes an investment as well. Um, there are a lot of schools that are very old. Some of the older schools, though, you can actually open the windows. So in the end, that might not be a bad thing, <laughs> but then they have asbestos, so they don't win. I don't know, but it's, yeah, there's... <laughs> Yeah, it's it, there's a lot of work to do. That's the good news. You won't be bored. <laughs> All right.
Great. Well, thank you very much. I really appreciate your time and for inviting me here. I've enjoyed it very much. Thank you. <laughs>